Y'all, a mere moments before I turned this camera on, Lumi the light fetus fell off of the wall. I legitimately thought my roof was falling in. <laughs> I wish that the camera had been on. Like, I am still shaking. Ah! <laughs> Sorry, Lumi the light fetus. If you're having a baby in a US hospital, most of the time you are told you're not allowed to eat anything. Where does this practice originate? Well, it's a little old. Like, do you remember when we still gave chloroform to people who were in labor to decrease their pain? Neither do I. That's because it was the 1940s when that stopped happening and the 1940s when this one emerged. In this video, we're gonna talk a little bit about where that practice came from and the data that it's based on. Then we're going to decide if we think that it makes sense. And I'll give you a hint. Uh, I do not think it makes sense. U.S. anesthesiologists do not come at me unless it is with data. Thank you. <laughs> as always, this video is meant to be educational and should not be taken as individual medical advice. Please talk to your doctor or midwife before making decisions for yourself. In 1946, a guy named Curtis Mendelson published a paper that was looking at some pregnancy complications. And in that paper, he identified a risk of something called aspiration of one in 667 approximately pregnancies. That is a risk of 0.15%. Aspiration is where you inhale stomach contents into the lungs. That can be extremely dangerous. It can kill you. It often doesn't kill you, but it certainly can. Now, aspiration, as a whole is thought to be increased in pregnancy for a few reasons. One of those being that you have an increase in pressure that pushes up on your stomach, which allows any contents of the stomach to come up more easily. Another reason being that in pregnancy, your gastric emptying, how fast your body digests the food in your stomach is slower. So you have a higher chance of having undigested food in your stomach. The risk of aspiration comes along mainly when we're talking about needing to do a cesarean delivery or some kind of surgery on someone who is pregnant under a general anesthetic. Most C-sections and surgeries that are done in pregnancy are done with a neuraxial anesthesia, so a spinal or an epidural, but sometimes they don't work or we can't use them and you have to be put completely to sleep with a breathing tube, which is a general anesthetic. The risk of aspiration comes with that part of this discussion. So already it's a pretty low percentage of pregnancies. In that original study from 1946, anesthetic techniques were primitive compared to today, to say the least, and we have advanced that significantly. So the risk of aspiration related to general anesthetic has drastically decreased over time. Despite that, the MPO recommendation, which you would think is written down on stone, biblically inscribed by Jesus himself, based on how strongly Twitter anesthesiologists have clung to this, despite not being able to even discuss the actual data or risk with me when I asked them to, was based on two deaths from aspiration in 40,000 pregnancies in 1946. For those following who like the numbers, the risk of dying from obstetric aspiration in 1946, when it was magnitudes more common to die from pregnancy and also anesthetic techniques made it easier to aspirate was 0.0045%. I don't know if you're into statistics, but that is very low. Okay, so that's where the, the recommendation comes from. And it's probably clear you can already tell how I feel about this, but we're gonna go through the data because I can support the reason I feel this way. We've established that the touted risk here is aspiration. And while pregnancy does convey a theoretically increased risk of aspiration, I say touted because the risk of a low risk laboring patient aspirating in pregnancy is all but non-existent. The risk of aspiration in all pregnancies, including low and high risk in modern times is actually quite difficult to tease out when you look at the data. Risk of death from aspiration in modern times is quite difficult to assess, particularly in low risk patients because you'll be hard pressed to even found a case report on someone dying from obstetric aspiration who did not have a serious risk factor for having that happen. I mean, you, you're hard pressed to find one even on someone who did, but I digress. We do have data coming out of the UK, which says that the risk of death from aspiration is probably around one in six million, one in, one in six million. A number which interestingly did not change before and after they stopped this NPO practice 16 years ago. Yes, you heard that right. The UK has not been doing this for 16 years. We also do not do this here in Aotearoa, New Zealand, where I currently work. I think it is worth noting that the developed nations who have better 
maternal and neonatal outcomes than us stop doing this a long time ago. I don't even know what the number needed to treat for this would be. Number needed to treat is a phrase we use in statistics. If you take a group of people, how many people do you have to treat with an intervention to forego one complication that you're trying to avoid? It has to be in the many, many thousands. Typically we consider a number needed to treat like over one in a hundred to be uh, questionable. One in thousands is would not be considered something that like the FDA would approve if you were trying to get a medication out there, for instance. Interestingly, the American Society of Anesthesiology recommends against full MPO status in labor, saying that they think it's okay for you to have clear liquids, which is a, a relatively recent change, but that they still stand by that you should not be allowed to eat in the process of labor. A statement that they recommend based on exactly no data, according to their own published recommendation. They actually state in that publication, there is insufficient, I can't even say it without laughing, there is insufficient data to support the consumption of solid food in labor, which is a wild stance to take, in my opinion, when no data to support the fact that it actually improves the outcome you're trying to avoid. In any other circumstance, then the answer to that would be, all right, cool. Since we don't have that data, uh, we'll let the patient make an informed decision and choose for themselves, right? Like since when did, oh, we don't have any data. We're just going to tell you what you have to do become the default. That's like uh, obstetric paternalism. That's what it is. The reason these numbers are so small is because if you look at low risk people who are in labor, the actual chances of them needing a cesarean delivery under a general anesthetic are really low on their own. And then in addition to that, the risk of them aspirating because of it is extremely low as well. Both an ACOG editorial and the previously mentioned American Society of Anesthesiology documentation cite a article that says 7% of in-hospital cardiac arrests during obstetric hospitalization are related to aspiration. And they use that as evidence that they think that this should be the policy still. You know, we've forgotten in the course of that that we don't have any information that says eating and drinking and labor actually increases your risk of aspiration. Again, I will state that the policy came from Mendelssohn's original paper, which half the aspirations were food and half were not. And we're advocating that you can drink but not eat. This is, it's not, it's, I'm just confused, okay? I'm just, I'm confused. It's confusing. Regardless of that, the risk of cardiac arrest during an obstetric hospitalization is incredibly low. Like that hardly ever happens. And I'm not saying that it, it doesn't matter when it does, Obviously, I've been a part of a cardiac arrest, meaning somebody's heart stops while they are admitted for an obstetric reason. And it's horrible and awful, but I don't think that the incredible rareness of that and then 7% of that incredibly rare event being related to aspiration, something we don't even know if we reduce the risk of by preventing people who are low risk from eating in labor justifies these blanket policies. I hope this is making sense. I mean, we can approach this like sensically, right? If I have a patient who is low risk for needing a C-section in general and who is incredibly low risk for needing a C-section under a general anesthetic and they come in and they say like, I just want to eat a little bit while I'm in labor. You know, this has been a long labor and I just want something to eat. We, we shouldn't just go. Yeah, actually one time in 1946, they published this paper that said that two people died after aspirating food. So nobody's eating or drinking in labor. Oh yeah. Also a lot of people aspirated that didn't have food in their stomach, but sorry. <laughs> just I don't understand. I very much appreciate the guidance from Ranscog on this, which acknowledges the small risk of aspiration, but also acknowledges the lack of data. Their recommendation is that people who are in labor should have light meals or drink access, and it should be guided by the patient. And I think that's a reasonable thing to do, right? Like if you have something that is one in six million risk of killing you, like if you're against that, then you got like, we can't even get in a car when we're pregnant, right? Because you're much more likely to die in a car accident. And I, I would argue that we know that not getting in a car reduces your risk of dying in a car accident, but we don't know that not eating during labor reduces your risk of dying from aspiration. So I, I actually, 
I actually think it would be more reasonable to say nobody can get in car while pregnant, which is a stupid thing to say. Now, I haven't even addressed the potential risk of not having any nutrition during labor. There are some good research studies on this topic, but they're equally inconclusive. So I don't think that it's worth making this any longer by going through all of that. Some of the people that I talked with about this on Twitter said something to the effect of like, oh, we're supposed to do no harm and it could do harm. Well, uh, I don't think we have a lot of evidence that it could do harm. I mean, I guess if we're going to theoretically accept that as fact, we can. But we also don't have evidence that withholding food from somebody who says they want to eat is not harmful, right? I mean, that could... Come on. This just goes back to a paternalistic attitude of people who are pregnant need to have decisions made for them, even about things that are incredibly rare because you don't have the agency to make those decisions yourself. That is the culture of a lot of medicine in the U.S., especially in regards to pregnancy. I mean, we talked about this with COVID vaccines when employers were refusing to give vaccinations to their pregnant employees because there was no data on it. Like, yeah, there's not much data on uh, on any of it. Shouldn't it be my choice if I want to protect myself? Like, no, you're pregnant. You can't make decisions for yourself. This is all, to me, wrapped up in this whole thing of not respecting the autonomy of people once they are noted to be pregnant. And that is a much larger issue that I think these things lay the foundation for. If we really want people who are pregnant in the U.S. to be treated with agency and autonomy, we have to start viewing these little decisions as things they are capable of making. And I think it's worth noting that most developed nations around the world have foregone this practice decade more than a decade ago, and they have better outcomes than us. I think it's important. I know some of you are gonna think this is a stupid video that's not important, but it's important to me. It's important to me. I think this is important. It doesn't have to be important to you, but it's important to me. And notably, if some of the arguments in on the Twitter discussion were like, well, nobody wants to eat and drink any labor anymore because they're just gonna throw up. Okay, well then tell them you might throw up. So if you don't want to throw up the food, then don't eat it. Like okay. The argument that oh, people wouldn't do it anyway is stupid because if they're not going to do it anyway, then you don't need a policy about it. And if you have a policy about it, you you probably think that they, they may want something to eat on hour 22 of waiting for their baby to exit their uterus with sufficient force that they have to provide. <laughs> Obstetrics needs more giving patients who are pregnant the information they need and allowing them to make decisions that are best for them especially when it comes to things which present an incredibly low risk and are places where we can make change to be a more patient-centered model of care in obstetrics in the U.S. If you're new here and you want to subscribe, I would love to have you. I'll see you next Monday.